People have been here a long time. We lost some people. They just either had to go and catch the tube or they had something on the tube they wanted to watch or something. I don't know. But I wanted to, uh, to make a few remarks. Um, first of all, uh, I... I, I want to address a few issues that I think are important and perhaps not for most of the people in the room but for other people and I would like you to convey this to the other people. There are people that have been talking about the work that's being done by Fuad Nahdi, by Abdurrahman, by Farina, by the uh, other groups that have been involved in this effort that this is a government uh, propaganda, that uh, this is stooges of the government of England, etc., etc. Many things. I'm sure some of you have, have heard some of these things. So I want to say a few things about that. Um, first of all, there's a verse in the Quran that is very interesting to me um, and probably to most of you. When janahu sarmi fajnah laha. If people incline towards reconciliation, incline with them. وَتَوَكِّلْ عَلَى اللَّهِ And trust in God. إِنَّهُ هُوَ السَّمِيعُ الْعَلِيمُ وَإِنْ يُرِدُوا أَنْ يَخْدَعُوكَ فَإِنَّ حَسْبُكَ اللَّهِ That incline, when they want to incline towards peace, you incline towards peace. And if they want to deceive you, if there's some hidden ulterior motive, God's enough for you. Don't worry about that. That's not your concern. Peace is so precious that anybody that reaches out for peace, you should reach out with them for peace. And another thing I want to say about this government, who do you think this government is? <laughs> They're called civil servants. Who do you think pays their money? Where do you think this money is from that the government has? It's from the pockets of the British people who pay taxes. There's two million Muslims in this country paying tax. They don't want a little refund? <laughs> no, seriously. I mean, I, I'm just amazed at this. Abu Hanifa said, Akru amwal al kufar biridahum jais. The wealth of the non Muslims, if they want to give it to you, it's permissible to take it. Now, I sat yesterday at Wilterbar, and I'll tell you something, Sheikh Abdullah bin Bayya. I, I didn't want to come here. I'm going to be honest with you. I was in California. I have, my wife is a brilliant cook. <laughs> really, I, I don't, there's no hotel food that compares to her food. It's not why I married her. She learned to cook after I married her. <laughs> but she's a brilliant cook. Her, her food is very good. It's nourishing. I feel good when, when I eat her food. And she cooks it with love. You can't get that in a, in a restaurant. I can taste the anxiety in their food. I can taste the anger of the cook when he's going through the thing. I can feel it. My, my cells feel it. But, and I also have really good tea. I come to England to buy the tea. I take it back. I have big supply. My tea is much better than the tea they give at any hotel I've ever stayed at England. I learned how to make tea from Abdul Azim Sanders, excellent tea maker. If anybody's ever had his tea, they'll know what I mean. So, but why leave the comfort of my home? Because my sheikh asked me, he said, this is an important thing, so come. So I came. I'm tired. So I'm going to be, whenever I get tired, I get more uh, open because my defenses are down. I'm going to tell you some true things. I used to not like the English people. <laughs> Seriously. I thought they were cynical. I, you know, the English people, the way they roll their eyes, there's a certain way that you know, there's a smirk that comes on their mouths when you say something. Really, very subtle things that you notice about the English. You know, there's a cynicism that's particularly Anglo-Saxon in its nature. And, and, and it's, it's really interesting. But I'll tell you something. I have come to love these people. And for a number of reasons. And I, and I want to talk about this because it's very important for all of you who are living here. This country is an amazing country. It has done many wrongs. And we could bring an Irish person here tonight and they could talk for hours 
about what this country has done. We could bring Welsh people, they might not be as eloquent as the Irishmen, but they could also talk for several hours about what the English have done to them. And you could bring some of my tribe from Scotland, really. You could bring some of them down and they'll give you with a nice brogue, they'll let you know what the English did from Edward Longshanks on or even before that. Seriously, they'll tell you about the English. But each one of these people has been challenged to learn to live with the English. Really. The Scots are very civil. They, some of them want independence, quite a number of them. But how are they going about that independence? They're not blowing up things. Really. They have other ways of doing it. The Welsh de-evolution has been a long time. The, they say the Welsh are the Irish that couldn't swim. <laughs> you know, it's been a long time since the Welsh have been uh, occupied much longer than Palestine. But the Welsh are a gentle people. I love the Welsh also, really. And I love the Irish. But it's taken me a while to really appreciate the subtleties of these different cultures. And so I, I really want to say there's two ways that you can live in your life. One way is the way of husn al It's having a good opinion. And the other way is the way of su al and years ago, my Sheikh Abdullah bin Bayya, we were in a gathering and he doesn't tolerate ghibah. It's one of the things I love about his majlis is he doesn't tolerate ghibah. You can't say anything about anybody, even people that you should say things about. He won't let you say things about them. And somebody mentioned something about Jamaluddin al-Afghani, who died a long time ago, last century, two centuries ago. And somebody said something and Sheikh Abdullah said a word, I never forgot it. He said, Ya Akhi, Ahsin al Dhan bin Mota, Jarrabna su al Dhan. He said, Have a good opinion of the dead. We've tried having bad opinions. We've tested it as, as a way of being in the world. And our Prophet had the best of opinions. Whenever the Quraysh reached out for him, he reached out for them. Mu'awiyah, we know in the Arabic tradition they call it Sha'ra Mu'awiyah. The, the hair of Muawiyah. Muawiyah is one of the most brilliant politicians in human history. He's a case study. You could do the leadership secrets of Muawiyah and it should be a bestseller. Muawiyah, they asked him and he said, if there was a hair of relationship between me and somebody else, if he pulled on it, I would release. If he released, I would pull. A hair of relationship. Just to keep that, that opening there, that potential. Now, I met yesterday, and you should be thankful that you have people like Maqbul Ali inside the foreign office. Because I have a good opinion of that young man. He's a bright young man, and he has good intentions. And he's there, he's representing your community. You live here, you pay taxes. This is your government. You, this is not Rawal Pindi. This is not Karachi. This is not Cairo. This is not uh, some funny uh, place off in the middle of the Muslim world where if you say anything against the government, suddenly you're in chains being dragged away. No, this is a country that you are citizens. I swear by this land and you are a lawful citizen of this land. You are citizens. This is not su subjection. You're not subjects, except in, in a very, you know, the British are citizens and subjects. But this is, uh, it's something superficial. The queen can't just arbitrarily send you off to the prison. And we should be wary of some of these laws being passed because they're against the essential nature of this country. And we have to remind the English, you're the people of the Magna Carta. You're the people of habeas corpus. This is your tradition. You gave this to the Western world. You're the people of John Locke. You're the people that brought these things. And you are the people of John Wesley, who this hall is named after. This glorious hall was named after John Wesley, one of the greatest reformers in Western civilization, who worked with William Wilberforce. And we're in the year of William Wilberforce. And I want to tell you about William Wilberforce. This is a man 
who from the, the early 20s was with a group in Clapham. And I hope I pronounced that right. He was in a group and there was an event in which 132 black Africans were discarded, thrown overboard on a ship called the Zong. It was a slave ship coming from West Africa to the Americas. It was an English ship. 132 black people were thrown into the ocean and drowned and this was considered legal by the laws of the land. And these, this group of young people who still had that spark of hope recognized how despicable this act was, how unacceptable this act was, and they started a small group of abolitionists to end the slave trade at a time when almost every single member of parliament was, was supported by the slave lobby. Things haven't changed all that much. But Wilberforce did not give up. He worked day and night. He was an incredible connector. He connected with people all over the country. He got people to sign things. He brought these in as a member of parliament. He worked with beautiful people like Hannah Moore. And several years ago, I suggested to the Muslim women in this country to start the Hannah Moore Benevolence Society. Because you should know Hannah Moore. You should know who Hannah Moore is. She's a beautiful English woman. She was stunningly beautiful in her looks. When she came to London, she took everybody by storm. She was a playwright. She was a literary figure. She was a poetess. She was all of these things. But in the end, she had a spiritual conversion. And she became one of the staunchest anti-slavery spokespeople in this country. She started night schooling. This is one of her great contributions. This is England to me. England is not the tyranny of Ireland. That's the worst of human nature that you find in every civilization. That's not England to me. England to me is these incredible ideals embodied by people like Florence Nightingale. I love Florence Nightingale. I studied, I read all of her, all these different works she'd written. I told my wife, you're the only woman I know who's jealous of a woman that died over a hundred years ago. <laughs> I fell in love with Florence Nightingale. Florence Nightingale said, England needs to go to the Sufis. This is, she wrote this in her book. She said, England needs to go to the Sufis. And Florence Nightingale entered the Sultan Hassan Mosque, where our uh, Grand Mufti gives the khutbah. And she said for the first time, she, she found what she was looking for. She said, I never found this in the churches of England. She said, I found equality, and I said, oh, would that there was a place for women in this religion. You know, they chased her out with a stick. And she said, I don't blame them. She went to Al-Azhar. She was struck by the spirituality, and she says in her diary, she said, I've heard in my heart Something telling me, turn to Mecca, face Mecca, face Mecca. All of humanity is one. We are all under one God, and there is salvation for all of us. I kept hearing in my heart, there is no God but God. Believe in the one true God. She was a Unitarian. She was not a Trinitarian. This is Florence Nightingale, one of the great icons of the British people. And she saw the beauty of Islam. This is a woman who was given a, 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 a qilada, this extraordinary medal by the Sultan Abdul Majid of the Ottoman Empire because she came and served the Turkish soldiers that were victims of the Crimean War as well as she served the British soldiers because she didn't, differ she didn't differentiate between people. This, this is England to me. This is the England I want to see. This is the England. I want to remind these people of who they are. They've forgotten who they are. These are the people of the great reforms of Western civilization. And we, of all people, should be reminding them. We share these things with you. You've forgotten who you are like we've forgotten who we are. This is the age of senility. We're all in spiritual dementia. Really, we're in spiritual dementia. This is, this is the old age, the dotage of, of humanity. And we need reminders. We've got collective Alzheimer's disease. And some of us has sometimes disease. We forget and then we remember. 
This is England to me. And, and it flows in my blood. I have ancestors from this land. This is my qawm. Ya qawmi. This is what every prophet said to his people. Oh, my people. They weren't, they weren't following his way. They were fighting him. They were opposing him. Ya qawmi. Inni Rasulullah ilaykum. Ya qawmi ma biya safaha. No, I'm not stupid. He didn't say, but antum sufaha. Antum kufar. Antum aghbiya. Antum hamqa. Ala tarawni. He didn't say, ma biya sifaha. I, I'm, no, you're wrong. I want good for you. In uridu illa islaha. Mastatat. You know, I just want to help as much as I'm able to. This, this, is, this is our teaching to go out and to engage these people. And I want to end because it's been a long night and you have uh, somebody. I was on an airplane and this man came up to me. He said, he said, brother, you know, I love your work. And I was like, mashallah, thank you so much. He said, no, no, really, it's just, so, I mean, it was, it's just so amazing what you did, and it was incredible, and this, but let me ask you one question. I said, sure. He said, why did you give up singing? <laughs> so after I sang him a few bars of Peace Train, one of my favorite songs, I told him I lost my voice. No, I said, uh, <laughs> I said, that's Yusuf Islam. Yusuf, we have the same name. There's three Yusufs tonight. It's Yusuf Mukab, you know. Yusuf to the third power. So, but I want to end with a story about one of my favorite people. And this is, who can tell me, not from the ulama, but who can tell me who Sayyidina Omar's favorite poet was? People say, Sayyidina Omar liked poetry? <laughs> Didn't he just listen to the Quran? The favorite poet of Umar ibn al-Khattab was Zuhair ibn Abi Sulma. Zuhair ibn Abi Sulma. Who is Zuhair ibn Abi Sulma? He's the father of Kaab ibn Zuhair, the man who wrote the Burda. He's the father of also his younger brother, uh, Kaab's younger brother who became Muslim before Zuhair before Ka'ab. Zuhair did not meet the Prophet. He died one year before. But I want to tell you a little bit about why Zuhair wrote his Mu'alaqa and then I'm done. And I want to use this as a metaphor for what we need to do. There is a war the Arabs call something Ayyam al-Arab. Ayyam al-Arab are the days of the Arabs. That's why Allah changed Ayyam al-Arab to Ayyam al-Lah. bi Ayyam al-Lah. Because the Arabs had their days, Allah has His days. The days of the Arabs were momentous things that happened to them. They say, Ash'aru Diwan al Arab. They used to write their history in their poetry. There was a war called Harbu Dahis. Harbu Dahis, you know who Dahis is? It's amazing we know his name. Dahis was a horse. It's called the War of Dahis the Horse. And, and Dahis was owned by a man who was uh, Zuhair ibn Qais al Absi. He owned a horse called Dahis. He had a friend who was from the Dibyan tribe, Hudayfa bin Malik. He had a horse called Ghabra. Now, Hudayfa was very jealous of Dahis, the horse of, of Zuhair. So he asked him to race. <laughs> so he asked him to race. So the two horses, they decided they'd race a hundred arrow shots. They shoot one time, two times, for a hundred times, and then they race. Well, the horses started out and Ghabra was winning. But once it got into the heavy sand, Dahis took the lead. Well, there was a group of the Bian, the Bianites, who were hiding in ambush and they ambushed Dahis and stopped him from winning the race, so Ghabra won. So what was the uh, bet? A hundred camels. So Hudayfa said, give me a hundred camels, because you lost. And then the Abs people told him, no, we saw the ambush. He didn't lose. You lost. You cheated. Give us a hundred camels. They kept on and on and on. Finally, Zuhair ibn Qais got so angry, he killed the brother of Hudayfa. He, he threw a spear at him, killed him. That started the war between Abs and Dibyan. You know how long that war lasted? Forty years over a stupid horse race. Forty years. That's how long the war lasted. Now what happened was, and this is a very interesting story, much later after many, many people were killed from Ghatafan, to the point where Zuhair ibn Qais, you know what he ended up doing? He went to Oman, became a Christian, and spent the last days of his life weeping over the war he started. 
because he said he could never look at anybody from his tribe because he'd caused so much suffering and bloodshed amongst these people. So what happens? There's a man, Al-Harith, Al-Absi, Harith ibn Auf. This man, he asked his cousin, Kharija bin Sinan. He asked him, which tent of the Arabs do you think would not let me marry his daughter? And he said, definitely, he'd never let you marry his daughter. So what's he do? This is typical male problem. He gets on his camel and he heads for this guy's tent to ask for his daughter. Of all the, it's the thing that he can't get, that's the thing he wants. This is the human problem. So he gets there and this man, Aus, comes out and he says, An'am sabahan. He says, An'am sabahan. Good morning, good morning. He said, what are you doing up here? Ya Sayyidat Arab. He said, I want to marry your daughter. He said, get the hell out of here. <laughs> right? I mean, really, that's pretty much what he said. This made Al-Harith furious. He takes off with his cousin, and they're leaving. So what does Aus do? He goes into the house. His wife says, what happened? What just happened? Who was that? He said, it was, it was uh, uh, Al-Harith. Uh, bin Aus, Sayyidat Arab. And he said, what did he want? He wanted to marry one of my daughters. She said, if he's the Sayyid al-Arab, why didn't you marry one of the daughters to him? And he said, that's a good point. It's just, he, he got me off guard and I was angry. <laughs> and she said, well, go make amends. He said, I can't. What's done is done. She said, what do you mean what's done is done? You mess everything up and then you're not going to go fix it? Go out there. And he says, what do I say? He said, just tell him you got him in a bad mood. And, and, and tell him, come back and we'll work things out. So he goes and al Hadith initially is angry. He comes. What's he do? He says, I want you to choose one of my daughters. I have three daughters. The first one comes out. She says, I don't want to marry him. This is right. Arab women had no rights. She said, I don't want to marry him. He says, why not? She says, first of all, I'm not that good looking. I'm not his cousin. And, I'm, and, and, and he's going to take me far away. And he'll grow tired of me, divorce me, and then what? So he says, good point. Bring the second daughter. She comes. I want you to marry this man. What do you say? Look, my first sister is better looking than I am, and I don't have any talents, and I don't want to go far away from you because who's going to protect me if he gets uh, feisty with me? Good point. Finally, the hope is on the last daughter, the, the little one. Her name is She comes in, and he says, Listen, Al Harith wants to marry you. What do you say? She said, Well, given that I'm the most attractive of my sisters, <laughs> I'm extremely talented, and I have a most distinguished father, I don't see how he could refuse me. And then, if he treats me badly, God will definitely let him have it. <laughs> so she says, He says, Great. He tells her they get married. As they're moving out, they set up a tent next to the house. He goes in to consummate the marriage. And that's a nice word for things people do on their wedding night. So when she gets in there, when he gets in there, she says, what kind of a woman do you take me for? We're right next to my father and my brothers. No, let's go. So they get on, they're driving. A little ways out, they're a ways out. He tells his cousin, listen, you go up ahead and I'll catch up with you later. Fine. He stops by the sets up the tent, and she says, what kind of woman do you think I am? I mean, this is the way people that, that take women in wars behave. Take me to your home, slaughter sheep, make a big festival. And he thinks, this is a high-minded woman. So he takes her, and then his cousin says, hey, listen, did you do what you wanted to do? And he said, no, and he explains him. And so they get back, he does a big festival. When it's all done, he comes in, how, how's things now? She said, I want to ask you one question. What kind of a man are you? <laughs> because I thought you were a man of honor, but I want to ask you one question. How is it that you can delight in women when there are people, Arabs, right now killing each other over a horse race? She said, go out. If you want me as a wife, go out and spread peace amongst these men and end this bloodshed. And so he goes out and tells his cousin and he says, this is a high-minded woman and she will give you great sons. 
So let us go out and do this. They went out and they determined, the Abs and the Dibyan agreed that if they would count all of the dead, whoever had the most killed, they would pay camels, blood writ. These two men from their own wealth, 3,000 camels to end this war. And this is when Zuhair wrote his mu'alaqa in praise of these two men for what they did. But I think it's Buhaysa that he should have written the mu'alaqa about. Because that is where it has to come from. It's the women in our homes. They're the ones that can change this situation more than anybody else. Our women need to, to, to be like Buhaysa and get our men squared away. And I really mean that. You are the vice gerents of God. And extremism is here to stay, folks. This is the most extreme society, and I'm talking about the whole globe right now. We're in the most extreme conditions in human history. We've got extreme eating. You know what we drink now for a, in my, when I grew up, small was like this, medium was like that, large was like, now the, the, that's medium. <laughs> they call it a big gulp. That's extreme eating. The plates they give, really, in restaurants, it's enough. I used to eat, we remember, we used to have 10 people around a plate like that. And they're all walking around. They can't even control themselves anymore. Seriously, they're having to take out Victorian seats in the theaters of England because the American fat behinds can't fit in them anymore. <laughs> this is the reality of our, really, we're extreme. We're eating extreme. We're, we're extreme. Look at the extreme sports in this country. You know what Sky says? You know Sky, Sky Television? It says, if your religion is football, then worship with us. <laughs> you know, they call us idiots because our community killed people over what somebody said about the Prophet Muhammad Wasallam. They kill each other because some football team beat another football team. Seriously, these are sufaha everywhere. But what, what, really, what is more stupid to kill over a stupid football game or to kill because the greatest person in your life has been desecrated, denigrated? They're both wrong. But don't call our people fools and not call your own people fools. Seriously, this is extremism in its worst qualities. They have, look at the pornography that they have, the denigration of these poor women. You know, the word in Arabic for oppression is related to the word for prostitute because prostitutes are the most oppressed human beings on the planet. And there's sexual slavery all over this planet. And some of the biggest downloaded uh, things on the Google search engine, according to their own statistics, the pornography is in Muslim countries. So what's happened to people? Really think about this. We're in extreme conditions. We have to, we have to, we need the abolition from our nafs. This is real. You know the Arabs say, al hurru abdun ma tama, wal abdu hurru ma gana. You know that the 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 free man is a slave as long as he desires other than God, and the slave is a free man as long as he's content. This is real abolition. This is what William Wilberforce, his movement needs to be resurrected. But we need liberation from our own egos. Jazakumullah khairan. It's been an honor. I love you. I love this country. I want to see good for this country, really. And this government, there's, there's, there's much to say about the, the bad things of this government. And, and you know my criticism. I'm against the war in Iraq. I want the war to end. I want these British troops home. I don't want them over there. I don't want the American troops over there. I am against this. I have always been against it. Really, I'm completely against it on both sides. They're both unacceptable. It's terrorism on both sides. They're both terroristic conditions. You're terrorizing people in their homes, really using cluster bombs in Lebanon. This is terrorism, and it needs to be condemned as terrorism. And, and I condemn it. I condemn it, really. We all condemn it. All of these people condemn it. So we need to recognize that. But this, this government has much good in it. And, and, and our teachers teach us, إِن كُنْتَ فِي نِعْمَةً فَرَعَاهَا إِنَّ الْمَعَاصِي تَزِيلُ النِّعْمَةً if you're in a blessing, watch out. You better guard it. Because once you lose it, it's gone. And disobedience is what causes it to be lost. And the Arabs say that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He said that wijdan and ni'am, right? Ida ma'urifat. You know, a ni'am, if you don't recognize them, then fiqdan and ni'am. 
You arrefu kabiha. You know, losing your blessings is what teaches you your blessings. So before you lose them, count your blessings. Win ta'udu ni'mullah, la tahsuha. Jazakum Allah khairan. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa